Welcome to the Spaceship Earth Mission Log podcast. I'm here with Carrie Norton of the mission, the Flywheel Project. And I'm excited to have Carrie here because she's a founder of the Green Business Base Camp and does consulting for impact investors, specializes also in entrepreneurial leadership coaching, and is really trying to spread the message of hope with regard to the issues that we face. And most notably for me, she's the co-founder of the Sustainable Business Council of Los Angeles. So you've got some experience in the field and I know next to nothing. So I'm really excited to learn from you. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. And thanks for doing this important work. Thank you. So can you tell me a little bit about your mission, the Flywheel Project? Absolutely. So I've been in this field of climate sustainability for a really long time. I'm 53 and I started down this path when in, well, I've actually been involved in some level of these kinds of issues for even longer, but more formally, I started at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development in 1998. Wow. Cool. And that's when I made my professional commitment to sustainability. And, and so I've had, you know, there's a lot of water under the bridge. And so I've had enough time to look longitudinally at how much progress we're making in the field. And I've been on fortunate enough to be in a, a number of different circles where we've actually had some impact. We've made some progress and I've been maybe not on the bleeding edge, but certainly on the leading edge of sustainability efforts for a long time in a variety of different capacities. And I started thinking leading up to my 50th birthday, which goes on, you know, like more like six years ago now, because three years in advance of turning 50, I was like, wait, I've been at this for a really long time. What have we actually accomplished here? Mm. And how are we moving the needle or not? And um, right around that same time, I think it was 2017, Paul Hawken, who's a, a friend and a mentor and somebody I admire enormously, published Drawdown. And so that coincided with me asking these bigger existential questions about what kind of impact I had been able to have in my career in collaboration with many others that I've been working with along the path. And I really felt like we uh, what we've been doing was necessary, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. What we've been doing was with the best of intentions, but it wasn't enough. And so, you know, the old Einstein quote, what is it like? Keep doing the same thing differently to expect and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Yeah. So I thought, well, what am I going to do differently? Assuming I have another 10 or 20 or, you know, knock on wood, 30 years to bring people together around the questions of how we're going to change our relationship to nature. I started thinking like, well, what am I going to, what am I going to do differently? And that's when Drawdown came out and what I was inspired about mm. Drawdown for um, among many other things was the extent to which they were coming out with solutions. Yeah. So they published these hundred solutions and they'd done all the math, done all the science, done all the quantification behind the solutions and helped us as a global civilization start to understand the, the prioritization that was necessary. And, you know, if we were going to have to prioritize, which clearly we do, since we don't have that much time, where are we going to start and where can we have the most impact? And yeah. so that inspired the Flywheel Project, because I thought if we have the appreciation for how much needs to be done in each of these hundred solutions categories, how are we going to know when we're making progress? Right. So that's really... The genesis of the Flywheel Project, which is designed as a free global public registry for progress against the 100 drawdown solutions. And so the idea was to be able to figure out how do we add up all the projects that are happening that are CO2 reduction projects in a, a global registry to illustrate and encourage more progress and encourage greater flows of capital to the solutions so that we actually have some sense that we are making progress, that we're making rapid progress, and that more progress can be made if we encourage the flow of capital and encourage projects to be developed in each of the, call it even high, the top 10 solutions. So that's really the, that's the inspiration behind the Flywheel Project. Excellent. 
You also mentioned that you are working on a tool for illustrating and narrating the progress towards ecosystem regeneration through carbon reduction activities, and also hoping to make a platform to match capital to viable projects and vice versa. So it sounds like the idea is to let people know, like, not only what's happening, like having milestones and a progress meter on, you know, for some inspiration in terms of like, this is possible, uh, but also to connect people together and projects together and capital together. And you also mentioned just everyday people being able to provide some hopefulness to your average citizen, like what, what can I do? And I love that. Exactly. So if you think, I mean, what you've just described is how the Flywheel Project becomes manifest. It's manifested through a web-based platform. And I'm just, since I can, I'm going to go ahead and start naming some of my aspirational partners for this work, which are people like Katie Patrick. So Katie Patrick is this incredible woman who's doing amazing work with illustration and design and gamification on the web around climate. And she's written children's books. She's, she's extremely mm. prolific. But so when we talk about the citizen engagement piece of this, which frankly, I'm not sure whether that comes last or first, I think it's last, mm. um, or, or certainly not first, because we've got to get the back end designed and up and running. But the citizen engagement tool is important as an overlay onto the infrastructure and the skeleton of the Flywheel Project data and details and visualization. Because again, if we create a really compelling visual interface and a way to interact with the solutions and the projects and the money, then we can give citizens opportunities to participate in that. And that is, um, that's where I would love to see Katie Patrick's work come into play. But before we get to that, before we get to the citizen engagement piece, you know, the challenge, if, you know, as long as we're here, the challenge is, first of all, um, to create the registry is not that complicated. The big, I would say, bottleneck is the data gathering. Mm. So how are people tracking the CO2 reductions and mm. how are they accounting for projects that are completed or underway? And, you know, this gets into the whole sort of nebulous and immersion area of verification and et cetera, mm -hmm. that is still, again, in its very early days. So basically figuring out ways to gather the data of what projects are being done where in which category, you know, imagine basically a database of, let's say, Google or the city of Los Angeles or, you know, name your municipality or county or company that's got a net zero strategy and they're trying to re do reductions. A lot of them are buying offsets, which, you know, anyone knows where that's going to end up. Mm -hmm. But basically, we want to be able to quantify and document what projects are being done and how much CO2 they're intended to reduce and add all that up in a table mm -hmm. yeah. and then compare that against, you know, any given solution. So you went to school in Saudi Arabia as a child. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit about that? Uh, you're not the only guest on the show who's had very significant experiences abroad as a formative part yeah. of your DNA. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, and thanks for doing such great research. So I was actually born in the United States. My parents met in Saudi Arabia in the mid-1950s. Mm. 1958, wow. my mom went there. She was working in television in New York on a show called Omnibus that was a project of the Ford Foundation. Mm. And her best friend decided to go, she was a nurse, and she decided to go to Saudi Arabia to work. Um, the country was opening up, developing all kinds of capacity via importing, frankly, Western talent at the <laughs> time to you know, build up the resource base for oil production and manufacturing mm. and sales and worldwide global distribution. So my mom went to work in television and radio there, and my dad had gone there to teach. He had just come out of the Korean War, and he, I, for, I forget exactly how he learned about the opportunity, but they met there, and they got married there, and they had one child, and then they adopted me from the United States, and so I went there when I was 10 days old, wow. and I lived there until 1989. Wow. So my parents lived there for 30 years. And I was in school there from zero to 14. Hmm. 
And we lived in an expatriate community. Everyone worked for the Arabian American Oil Company, hmm. which is now called Saudi Aramco. And there were lots of expats there from all over the world. So I, I lived in a very multicultural environment. We had access to the best education you could imagine. And um, I credit that experience with, because we lived there, but we also traveled quite a bit and went on repatriation vacation every year as a benefit that the company provided. And so we would come back to the United States, but we also spent a lot of time traveling around the world. My parents were very avid and adventurous travelers. So that's, you know, it's fundamental to who I am. I think people call us third culture kids. Um, Mm. But the idea that, you know, I think one of the greatest qualities that that developed in me beyond being interested in other languages, beyond being interested in other culinary and cultural traditions, it really helped me develop a lot of empathy for Mm. the extent to which not only am I someone of enormous privilege, but, you know, we see that there's so many different ways that humanity experiences life, but also fundamentally we're all the same. And so, you know, I think Einstein, I'd heard this quote just over the weekend, Einstein said something to the effect of you live in a way that you either end up perceiving the world as a safe and good place and people as good, Mm -hmm. or you can perceive the world as a hostile place. And so to me, the experience we had living there and experiencing so many different cultures and seeing so much of the world really led for me to see the world as a very hospitable, warm, generous, amazing place Mm. and with people that are generally good. And, you know, that's really helped me in my life to be optimistic and to have so much hope. Good. Yeah. That's an incredible point because I think that optimism is important in order to work together too, because we have to collaborate globally in order to solve global problems. And uh, have you ever thought about the fact that your parents were helping with oil extraction. Yes. <laughs> Great I mean, question. that's something it, it doesn't bother me because I understand that this is this is what was happening and this is, you know, what you learned from it. But I know some people are like, oh, my gosh, like. Yeah, no, the irony is not lost on me. In fact, I almost wrote a book about it when I was starting my company. I uh, was a. Uh, working with a journalist who really wanted to me to write a biography of my life story, because at the time I was, um, you know, I was an executive in the commercial solar power industry and there weren't very many women in the field. And so we actually wrote a whole book outline and submitted it to an agent, but I got uncomfortable about a sort of a memoir biography angle on the story. So um, Mm -hmm. I do want to write a book someday, but it's not going to be about me, but It is not lost on me that I grew up in the oil fields. What I like to say to people is the privilege of living and growing up in the Middle East in that time, and even for that matter, the privilege that my parents had to travel there and to be there and to meet there and to raise a family there and to send us, you know, to the best, you know, to give, to offer us the best education that in the world is really what I hope to be possible in this transformation away yeah. from fossil fuel energy and into renewable energy and into regeneration. I would like for that transition to be as quote unquote profitable for yeah. everyone who's engaged in it as the, the oil economy was for my family. My parents yeah. came from very modest beginnings. My mom came from a working class neighborhood outside of Boston My father came from a farming family in Texas and they both, my dad had a college education and ultimately a master's degree, but um, my mom never went to college and the opportunity that was available to them because of this era and because of this global industry is the same wish I have for everyone stepping into the climate field or on the regenerative pathway today is that we redefine profit and we redefine value in such a way that all the externalities that 
haven't been accounted for in the last 50 years start to get accounted for in the new business models and the yeah. new ways we do finance so that those same that those generation can have the same level of opportunity that I experienced. So that's sort of how I yeah. think about the, the transformation and the transmutation, if you will. I think that's extremely important. Thank you for saying that because opportunity is a thing that we still want to have and we still want people to have. And so for people early on, you know, in the United States, you know, think of the Beverly Hillbillies era, right? The oil represented opportunity and the ability to go That's from right. Ozarks poor to suddenly like wealthy because we found this thing in the ground, this abundant natural resource that we didn't understand at the time what that would create. But, you know, that, that the idea of opportunity and what that represents and also is really important for people to be able to to have opportunities in all over right. the world, not just a limited amount of people, not just lucky people, not just the select few. We want to create, you know, we look at the abundance of the sun. I mean, the sun is everywhere on the planet, you know, every day we have the sun and that's an abundant resource. So why not create opportunity through more beneficial means for all of us through the planet? And, you know, also I think because you had that experience of growing up in Saudi Arabia with a family working in oil, I feel like that must have somehow influenced your choice of career path, like made you who you are now. Oh, I wish that were true. I wish, I wish that would be a really neat and tidy story. I, I, I have to tell you, I honestly don't know where it came from, but it's, it does date back pretty far. And it started in, it started really around the dinner table for me mm. and getting interested in food and then getting interested in hunger and then getting interested in sustainable food systems and then getting interested in sustainable agriculture and then starting to see you know, what that was all about. And then falling in love with how food was grown and going to work on an organic farm and really just falling in love with all things natural, which had really nothing to do with anything that I was exposed to as a child, to be honest. <laughs> but to your point, like, you know, again, it's not lost on me that that I've ended up in this field, but it really emanated from my love of food and my mm. love of how food is grown and my love of the idea that we, there is enough food to your point about abundance. Like, and you know, this is a really important, I think intellectual and emotional shift that we all need to make right now, which is we live in a very abundant world. And the question is, how, who gets to access the abundance and who gets to look at it that way? And yes. we, as the capitalist, economy starts to falter and starts to arguably die out and we start to shift our mental models and realize the abundance that's available to us that opens up all kinds of opportunities and i never understood from a very young age how it was that people were going hungry and ps by the way 30 years later 40 years later that is still the case you know mm -hmm. it, it's it's inconceivable to me that there's so many hungry people especially here in the United States of America, but around the world, there's mm. enough food for all of us to eat. So mm -hmm. how is it that things aren't getting distributed in a more equitable way? And yeah. there again, that gets back to the question of systems design. It gets back to the question of fundamental perception of the availability of abundance. And so all of those kinds of transformations are necessary for us to see the world in new ways and to believe that it's possible for all of us to live here in ways that are more comfortable for everyone. Yeah, I totally agree. And we could do a lot better in distributing resources. And I think that the inequities that the monetary system creates are a big part of the systemic misallocation of resources. The fact that people are so concerned about money first is really just a, you know, it's it's like missing out on the other forms of wealth 
that exist, exactly. friendship and clean air. And uh, there's so many other ways. There's like, you know, eight different forms of capital that there's That's relational right. capital and there's resource capital. Like the fact that you have a car to drive is a form right. of wealth and abundance. A place to sleep is a form of abundance. And those things are very important to the whole picture. Um, now you have a very strong background in business management. Your MBA was in Latin American business environment. Uh, you And you had corrected me earlier about, what was that? that I missed a piece. What was that? Yeah. Well, the idea, I mean, just to simplify it for everyone, the idea was that I was going to have a career in Latin America. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a fluent Spanish speaker, and I was really interested in the Latin American regional business environment, I think is what, what it was called, and and how the, you know, how the continent of Latin America was emerging. I was really interested in, in having a career in that geography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in an emerging market that also has great potential to impact the environment in terms of the, the way that the rapidization of westernization was done could really have caused a lot of harm probably at that time. We were all becoming aware of the impact that business was having on the environment in emerging markets, right? Exactly. And I mean, there was back in the day, I mean, this goes back a long time now, but the idea was um, there was a real opportunity for leapfrogging um, and just sort of transcending, if you will, some of the legacy capitalist structures and infrastructure to be able to marry purpose with profit and do things differently. So that was the idea, certainly. And in that, in that vein, I had an opportunity to go work in, I mean, really my dream job, which I ended up turning down, sadly. I don't, you mm. know, life is full of sliding door moments, but yeah. um, I wanted to work in venture capital in Latin America. And I did get an offer to do that to work in the first impact incubator in Mexico wow, with an amazing guy named Lorenzo Rosenzweig, who, you know, again, if I have any regrets in my career, one of them is not going to work with Lorenzo. But mm. in any case, that impact incubator was really the first of its kind, I think, anywhere in the developing world. And to be able to help foster entrepreneurial businesses with venture capital for positive impact on the environment and society was my dream. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going in a different direction. I had, you know, many other wonderful experiences, but that was sort of the the impulse back then and, and why I got so interested in that region. You did end up working at Idea Lab while you were at SunTech. Is that right? Yeah. Well, so yeah, there was a number of experiences in in between, but so I worked in venture capital for a firm called Garage dot com. That was my first job out of business school. That's the effectively the job that I took instead of going to Latin America and mm. which then led to me doing a lot of work in the clean tech space while I was living in Austin, Texas, which then led me to Idea Lab. And yes, I moved out to California where I remain in 2004 to work at Idea Lab in the one of the earliest clean tech companies in the modern clean tech era. It was called Energy Innovations. And then it became EI Solutions. And then we sold the company to SunTech, at which point I left. So I stayed at SunTech for a few months and then I got laid off. Mm. But anyway, from 2004 to 2010, I think, I'm not great with years, but for six years, I had an amazing experience being part of that amazing company and being part of that acquisition. And then I stayed in the industry for a little while after that and went to work for one other company before starting mm -hmm. my own. And how did you find the space camp? Like what got you involved with the Buckminster Fuller Institute world? And how was that experience for you? Like how did that overlap in terms of, you know, you bring all this experience and you're meeting other people who have experience in this area, especially getting to see like Brian von Herzen talk and things like <laughs> really inspiring stuff. Tell me a little bit about how you connected with the space camp. Well, I've known about Buckminster Fuller's work for a long time and got introduced to the BFI Institute, I don't know, it seems like two decades ago or something, but um, I've been hearing more about it in recent years and he really took a systems view of the world and I myself am a fellow of the Academy for Systems Change and really interested in systems thinking and systems transformation. And so- mm. 
because that's the lens that I use for my work now, I kept bumping into BFI quite a bit and have admired Amanda Joy Ravenhill and was curious about the manual for Spaceship Earth and, you know, just kept sort of seeing it out of the corner of my eye. And then it was just sort of a matter of timing and, you know, luck, I would say, that the camp was available during a window when I had a little bit of bandwidth. Uh, and frankly, I've been working on the Flywheel Project, um, I would say largely in isolation. I've had a few collaborators that have come and gone for no fault of their own, just my own inability to kind of stay focused on the project. Mm-hmm. But I really felt like it was an opportunity to deepen my awareness of what is happening at the Institute and with Bucky's work. And then I really felt like I wanted to expose myself, like (laughs) do some exposure therapy with the Flywheel Project to see if there might be some collaborators or, you know, some ideas that I've been missing Mm -hmm. Um, because I've been kind of sitting on it for a number of years. I started thinking about it several years ago and I really haven't made a lot of progress. So I was kind of hoping that it would be very obvious to some folks in the community that, yeah, this project makes sense and it would be a good service to the world and it would be actually not impossible to do. And so that's kind of why it made sense to explore it. So you now. know Paul Hawken, you said, I if I oh, heard yeah. you correctly. Yeah. Explain, tell me more about that. Because, you want me to say more? Yeah. I mean, I know Amanda yeah, Joy well, Ravenhill has moved on from the Institute to get more involved in Project Drawdown. So I know Paul's book is very influential in that space. So please Yeah, share. well, I think Amanda Joy was actually a, a co-founder of Drawdown and worked with Paul very closely on the first, you know, on Drawdown and the publication. And My understanding is that Amanda has moved on to actually work with a team of incredible people at Regen Intel. Mm. So, which I can explain a little bit about just because I happen to attend or watch their launch video. I'm very keenly interested in their work. I can't speak to their relationship, but I know Paul from, I mean, Paul's one of You know, he's absolutely one of the most influential people in my life and very, very early inspiration for me to be on this path. Hmm. And you have to imagine you're, you look quite a bit younger than me. So I, you know, starting down this path when I was 25, effectively, there weren't the same resources, there weren't the same tools, there weren't the same organizations, there just weren't that many ways to, and there certainly weren't the career opportunities that are no, available now. So I can imagine everything had to be done by hand, emerging. if you will, right? Yeah. Like I had to just develop my own curriculum, read the books, you know, follow my own curiosity, meet the, the people that I would be inspired by and find the opportunities and create them. So Paul is one of the earliest influences and I've read all of his books more than once. The Ecology of Commerce was particularly profoundly impactful for me because again, I was really interested in business and giving back and positive impact. And, you know, his, that book, I don't remember what year he wrote it so early. He's, you know, he was just, he's just been very prescient Mm -hmm. in all of his work and so clear. And, you know, I mean, he's such a beautiful writer. So he was like water in the desert for me. And there Mm -hmm. were others around that same time but he was my curriculum. And then everything he's done, I've just, you know, it's just made, it's been so clear to me that he knows where we need to go in civilization. Hmm. And, you know, that was true in Drawdown and that's now true in Regeneration. And, you know, and so Paul's always on the bleeding edge, many miles out in front of the rest of us. And so when I started my company 10 years ago, I had a great friend who is an amazing, mm, luminary in the space, Jen Bolden, and she knows Paul well. And when I was starting my company, I really wanted to connect with Paul and see if he might be willing to help me launch. And indeed he was, and it was an honor of a lifetime for him to be president at our launch day and teach. He taught a whole class of entrepreneurs for half a day about the fundamentals of what a person needs to know when they're starting a company to try to have positive social and environmental impact. So, yeah. So, and we've stayed in touch and I, yeah, he's just sort of my beacon, one of my most important beacons. 
Incredible. It sounds like you know very influential people in the space. And of course, you know, the Academy with Donella Meadows, I, I've heard that come up in other conversations, a wonderful place to engage as well in this space. And so I kind of want to say calling all collaborators for the Flywheel Project. If you want to work with Carrie and in the space, there's such knowledge that you bring already and such connection. I think it's something I've noticed with many of the missions. The interesting part is, you know, when you make the jump from working on an idea or a passion just on your own. And then you make that leap to working with collaborators and being able to co-work, co-vision, and co-team these projects is really when they take off. So your project was in the formulative stage when we did the space camp. And so you did not present in the final presentation, but you're considering the project still open. You're wanting to continue and you're still looking for collaborators. Is that right? Absolutely. And, you know, again, as I said, this project's been in the formulative nascent emergent stage for a long time. This is one of the, I suppose, just as long as we're being transparent here, one of my Achilles heels is that I have some ideas that I think have merit, but I have a really hard time sometimes getting them off the page. Yeah. And um, I've had I several people... <laughs> well, that's kind of why I'm saying this, because I think a lot of people can relate. Yeah. You know, perfectionism, fear of being wrong, fear of getting exposed publicly for not knowing as much as I think I know. All those things are things that hang me up in a lot of ways. And this is one of those examples of where I've had some amazing people who've stepped in to try to collaborate with me along the course of this journey. And, and yet, ultimately... I'm expected to do the heavy lifting. And so yeah. far, I haven't been able to do those things in a way that kind of keeps everybody engaged in a meaningful way and, and is able to make progress. So there's a part of me that is doing this with you because I feel like, yes, I want collaborators for sure. And, you know, it's it's a way of forcing myself to expose where I'm coming up short mm -hmm. on this project. You know, it's an idea. It, I think it has merit. I think it could be really powerful. I'm not seeing it as a way to make money. It's really, it's, I feel it's like a, it's an offering for the world is really how I view it. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to bring more transparency to the progress we're making and more engagement and more progress. That's really, those are the three motivating factors for me. And so ironically, that can't happen if people don't know about it. And so yeah. one of the things that we're doing here today is hopefully getting more people to understand what it's about and find a way to engage with me and bring some of the skills that I don't have. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was interviewing about the cooperating manual for Spaceship Earth, one of the biggest challenges is the back-end technology and all the work that has to be done to maintain a database. And we were talking about how it's almost unsustainable, and it's also hard to get people to that website and that resource. And so you can put all this work on the back-end into making something like that happen, and there's all these overlapping skills that you and I might not have in terms of coding and CSS and databases and things. And, you know, I, I've <laughs> something I just met someone the other day who deals with IT and databases, and he says, you know, People just wouldn't start an Airtable if they knew what they were building. They come back later and go, oh, this Airtable is all like loaded down, you know, and I have to go through and fix it. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, he's not in sustainable technology. You know, he's not going to space camp, but he's somebody that I know who that person would need to know to like, you know, a, a, but, you know, he's working for Meta, he's working for, yeah. for Google, he's working for these big companies. And I think that's, you know, we can talk about the investment space. We can talk about the corporate space because I think that is a big piece of the puzzle. There's a lot of knowledge there collectively that like it or hate it, it is a way that things do get done. So we can mm -hmm. discuss that. But the other thing, I mean, there's kind of a bridge to that is I, I, I'm dying to ask if the Flywheel Project has any resemblance to the concept by Jim Collins about turning the flywheel. Oh, yeah. Well, I love Jim Collins' work, yeah. and not directly, but as long as we're on the subject of Jim Collins, I think it's apropos to share that one of the things I've discovered about him um, in the last year or two that's been hugely inspiring. I mean, I've never gotten, candidly, I've never gotten around to reading his books, even though I'm certainly very familiar with his work conceptually, good to great, et cetera. I 
heard an interview with him where he on, actually was on Tim Ferriss. Oh, I, yeah, and he me talked, too. <laughs> I say you don't need to read the book. You just need to hear the interview. (laughs) Yeah, the interview is absolutely amazing. Highly recommend. Not that Tim Ferriss needs any more fans, but um, but that interview in particular was really profound, and because he doesn't give very many interviews, but he talked about this concept of hulak. Do you remember that part of the interview? No. Okay, so it's it's like I can't stop talking about hulak. It's the best thing. So hulak is you know we all meet certain people on our path and on our journey in life that are the people who've made a difference for us. Mm. Right. Paul Hawken is a perfect example of who luck. Um, I first met him through his authorship, but then I got to meet him in real life, but who luck are the people who, and I could name, I mean, I could just go down the list. I have so many people that I could, that are in my who luck club if you will, the people who've made a difference for me, the people who've given me a chance, the people who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, the people who gave me a job, the people who referred me to somebody who gave me a job, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I've had so much who luck in my life. And I just love that concept because actually, side note, (laughs) when leading up to my 50th birthday, I made a commitment that I was going to write 50 love letters to the people who've been most important in my life. Oh, that's cool. Great idea. Effectively a who luck list. Yeah. Um, and I've only done three of them. So I guess I'm about one a year. So I got to speed up the, the Although publication. Although three rate, but is intensely powerful. It's good. I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm pleased with the, the ones I've written, but I, I want to get the others done. But there's this idea of who luck. And I just think it's such a beautiful idea. It's like who, if you, if you take time to think about the people who've been so most important and instrumental in the good things that have happened in your life, it's just a fun exercise. And so I love Jim Collins for that. But with regard to the flywheel concept, that that actually came to me during my time at Idea Lab uh, mm. because we were working on next generation technology for concentrated commercial solar power rooftop production. And well, I don't have, I mean, I don't have really an engineering background to speak of at all. I mean, my background is in modern languages in undergrad and then business, but really no engineering. So I happen to have worked in technology. I happen to have worked, of course, loosely in engineering and construction at Idea Lab, at Energy Innovations. So I got exposed to the idea of a flywheel then. And it's just uh, really the idea with this project is that if we can create some momentum, then the momentum begets more momentum, more momentum. and it is self-generating yes. after a while. Well, and that's what Jim Collins talks about in turning the flywheel. The, you know, having symbiotic pushes, almost like trim tabs in the in the business, that each push helps spin the momentum like the merry-go-round. If you got three kids pushing and they're all pushing and that's sing, right. you know, and then identifying the spots in your flywheel that are the friction that are like creating counter um, negative motion to the flywheel that's taking away energy. And so you're able to, yeah, once you get this thing spinning, actually I actually was talking to my wife's grandfather is an engineer and he worked in bearings and uh, mm-hmm. he was saying, you know, instead of putting batteries on people's walls with all the lithium that's getting mined and the impact of the environment that's happening, why not just put a flywheel on the side of someone's mm. house because you can you can spin them up. The energy from the solar panels will spin them up and they will spin like free spin for a month and like 30 wow. days. And you can take the energy out of it just like a battery. So kinetically it stores that energy as motion. And right. then you just, as you're, it's generating power, you can, you know, sort of kick in the power generator and it'll slow it down a little bit. And the next day it'll, you know, add more motion back in. As long as you keep it going, you have a battery. And it's a kinetic battery. Well, I look forward to seeing his prototype. <laughs> well, he's passed on and he's, you know, it was uh-huh. just something he was always saying when he was reading the newspaper about climate. He's going, well, why aren't people doing this? And so yeah. I've talked to I've talked to people about this in the space camp who are working with solar technology. I'm like, you know, it'd really be cool if someone developed a flywheel that did this, you know, for people's houses. And yeah, so that's what it makes me think of. But also, you know, the analogy within business, this idea of creating this positive momentum, it's also kind of akin to the tipping point. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, where it's like there's this point at which 
there's a snowball <laughs> and you get mm -hmm. this positive reinforcement. So the idea is to make a positive feedback loop. So where you just get more and more and more benefit out of it. And I think as you've mentioned, I think in one of your podcasts that there's, there are certain things that are needing to be redirected. Like there's inputs to the system that are creating a negative effect or that drag on the system. And there's things mm -hmm. that need to be divested of in the inputs of investment capital. So you're working specifically with entrepreneurs and companies who are interested in aligning their inputs with a sustainable model and hopefully to get to that 3.0 version of sustainable where they're actually creating benefit in the world and not just sort of like status quoing it. Um, so let's talk a lot more about the Green Business Base Camp and what do you do with that? Because that's exciting to me. Like how do oh, you thank you. How do you work with entrepreneurs and and help them be sustainable? Yeah, well, I guess I should start by saying that I started that company 10 years ago and I really had a vision for creating offline programs that would lean to like an online learning platform. That was mm. the original plan. And we did launch with offline programs and through a whole series of things that happened or in the early days of that, that's when Paul came to teach that first course. Mm. And to be honest, I really struggled as an entrepreneur to bring my vision to life we did the offline and I had a whole business plan for how we were going to do the online. And I was trying to raise capital too early and I got some interest, but not enough. And then I tried to find partners and I struggled with that. And I really just was not successful in the way that I wanted to be in those early days. And so I ended up, um, it just had a series of challenges, frankly, that made it really difficult for me to manifest in, and then also my dad died, actually. Mm. Uh, there were a couple things that happened during that early time of launching my company. I had a friend commit suicide. Uh, oh. my dad died and I was, you know, the world wasn't ready for me in that form. Yeah. And I was just struggling. And so I ended up starting after my dad died, I came back, I went home to be with my family. And then I came back to California to kind of resume operations. And I started consulting because I needed some cash flow. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting really in the best possible way distracted for the next five years, working on women's leadership, mm. and then came back to running the company again. And it has manifested in a very different way than I had originally intended. I As got they really often engaged do. <laughs> yeah, in the coaching profession. And since 2017, I started really getting interested in the idea of regeneration. Mm. Um, and so I've really turned my attention in that direction. So, and of course, like there's a lot of conversation right now about whether sustainability is the way or regeneration is the way, or what's mm -hmm. the difference between the two or yeah. et cetera. And my feeling is that it's not one or the other. It's sort of an all of the above, but the difference mm -hmm. between, for me, between regeneration and sustainability is that regeneration takes into account the fact that there's a lot of healing that needs to happen on the planet. And there's yeah. a wholesale transformation that needs to happen in terms of our own internal frames of how we live in the world and our relationship to nature, and then how we're going to proceed to restore that which we have damaged and figure out how we give a lot more and take a lot less. I mean, that's really ultimately the compromise that we, I mean, if you want to call it that, that we have to make going forward. And this yeah. gets back to the same idea that I had with the Flywheel Project, which is that, you know, there's a lot of things happening in the world. I mean, at a lot of levels, uh, arguably at every level, mm -hmm. and we're still not getting where we need to go. So what's, what do we have to do differently? And regeneration is the gets at the heart of what I think we have to do differently. Yeah. Um, but as I started deepening into my generative journey, I started dreaming again about, well, maybe now is the time for the e-learning platform to be brought online, yeah. um, but through the lens of regeneration instead of sustainability. So mm -hmm. I have kind of tried to get back to my knitting with that and developing a platform called Regen Learn. And so that is what has become of Green Business Base Camp. So I guess, you know, if I'm going to get cheeky about it, you could look at the Green Business Base Camp website and say that it's pretty dormant. It is, has kind of been on ice for many years now. And that original idea did not come to pass. 
Mm-hmm. I've evolved a lot in the process. My thinking has evolved a lot in the process. And I feel much more clear now that regeneration is the path forward yeah. for civilization. And I think that there are a lot of people who are waking up to that fact. And so mm-hmm. now I'm trying to reconfigure the base camp proposition into this platform called Regen Learn. Excellent. Yeah, and I feel like that's a more sustainable model personally because you're able to not only share what you know, but do a version of what I've been able to do through podcasting, which is share what the people that are in my uh, who who luck. Who luck. Yeah, yeah as uh, who yeah. luck. Yeah, as well. Yeah. And that's actually really powerful too, because you become the um the like point where it's like, okay, I know who to bring in who is an expert mm-hmm. on those different things and who does who can speak to this more fluently than I can. Although speaking of fluency, you also speak you speak French, English, and Spanish. That was uh, mm-hmm. something that you know, I, I th- that was something that came up in this conversation in uh, one of Bobby Fishkin's groups. There was a topic of language and how much translation there is to do between yes. these different groups of languages and how much work it is to help, you know, to have to be the one who's constantly translating into English. And the analogy was the one-to-one of like different disciplines. So like you, you know, finance and I know a little bit about finance, but not very much. Like I haven't actually dabbled in that world because I'm interfacing with you and I maybe hopefully could ask you good questions. Then I can learn from you and then other people can share in that knowledge base and, and hopefully have like an interfacing point. And that's the magic of when we come together and we have all these overlapping Venn diagrams, right? Like, you know, you're, you're in my Venn diagrams, like interlapping in, in little spots. And then yours is interfacing with other people that I don't, but that knowledge then comes by me and by way of pollination in these ideas. So that's what I love about these conversations. And that's what I love about the idea of the Flywheel Project too, is like you mentioned that um, something that I've said a lot is that hope is really necessary for the movement forward. It's a key ingredient in creating this motion we're talking about because climate paralysis is a real thing. Like if people don't know that there's something that can be done, the tendency is just to kind of give up. And it's really important that we educate people on the progress that is being made on the technologies that do exist. And you said, we are the ones we've been waiting for. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I absolutely love that because I think there's this sense of self-empowerment in that, like, if you can find what your ikigai is, like, what is it that you're meant to be doing or that I'm meant to be doing? And if we're doing that, there are other people who we can interface with and share with that that's that weaves together in a way that's a lot stronger than just one person over here, one person over there. And uh, you've worked in a lot of different corporate environments and, you know, corporate environments can tend to be a little bit nearsighted in that there's usually one main focus or two main focuses that the company can do and they're getting together, but it's groups of people working together. So what have you seen in that environment that can work and where is it kind of off track? What are some things that maybe you would want entrepreneurs to know in order to shift the culture of how we collaborate toward these goals? Oh man, I don't think we have enough time for that. (laughs) I could talk about that for days. There's a number of threads. If you don't mind, I'd like to go back to a couple of other things that you said. And I'm sorry if I appear distracted. I was looking at my phone because I was looking something up. Right. Okay. Here it is. There, I found it. Okay. So I was listening to you intently, but something you said really sparked an idea in me. So I wanted, I felt like it was important to bring it in. So as luck would have it, to your point about language, I do think that's a real problem in all spaces and especially in the space of sustainability or regeneration. But I think it's true of all, you know, many parts of the system right now is that, you know, everybody's developed their own unique language, whether it's for finance or science or even sustainability, right? Like there's all this vernacular and jargon that, I suppose you could argue some of it's been deliberate even, Mm. right? Um, You know, I would say in the legal profession, you know, maybe not intentionally deliberate, but it's like the idea of like, you know. 100% in the case of the legal profession, that's the one that I would say absolutely deliberate. Like that's the most obvious one, right? 
So the language is designed to make you feel like you don't know what you're talking about, like you're stupid, and it's designed to scare you in a lot of ways. Yeah. And it's um, also designed to overwhelm you because when was the last time you read one of these terms and conditions addenda on a website? Yeah. Did Nobody you know that you're not that. supposed to use your iPhone to launch nuclear weapons? That's in the contract. It's like page 45. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, and yeah. So I just happened to be talking to a good friend and colleague of mine from the Academy for Systems Change this morning because he started his own consulting practice recently and his services, his company is called Simplify Language. Mm. And his whole inspiration is to be helping people make language more accessible to mm. everyone. And he comes at this through the lens of working with non-English speakers and yeah. helping them transition into English speaking in our country, teaching English as a second language. And, you know, so he has a bird's eye view of like how difficult it can be to navigate life when you don't speak the language. And so whether that's yeah. Spanish to English or legal to non-legal or yep. academic to non-academic, there's all these barriers. Or and entrepreneur so, to coder. Or entrepreneur to coder yeah. or investor to entrepreneur, you know, like yeah. it's all over the place, all these yep. separations and walls. So one of the things I've been very interested in the last couple of decades is like, how do we make everything more accessible to everyone? So that includes the language of systems thinking. Everybody's talking about systems thinking, but most people don't really know what it means. And how do we make those ideas more accessible? So I'm really interested in this idea of language accessibility. And it comes up in the context of my work specifically because shifting now from sustainability to regeneration, now I have to explain myself all over again and talk <laughs> about what regeneration means, Yeah, which I'm of course very happy to do, but Sometimes I wonder, is it really necessary for me to come up with new language? But mm. why do I come up with new language? Well, because I think people, the language gets diluted over time. Yes. And also I've learned a lot. And so sustainability is necessary again, but not sufficient for what needs to happen. Because we've yeah. been at this for 30 years as a civilization since the first Rio summit, and we are nowhere near where we need to be Yeah. in terms of our transformation. And so- we have to be willing to evolve and language is one thing that it's both important and also can be complicating and complexifying for people. So yeah. it's a tricky business, but anyway, I wanted to just share that Lee's work is really important and I'm going to work with him on some things to, you know, to again, continue down this path of helping to make all of these ideas, which, you know, whether it's Bucky's ideas or um, systems thinking ideas, these are ideas that are fit for purpose for our time, yes. but they're not necessarily accessible to the vast majority of people yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're the ones who make them accessible. I mean, and, yeah. and honestly, I think people are hungry for the ideas, but maybe need like a step down transformer. Which, exactly. you know, often like, Good you analogy. know, I'll be at the supermarket and someone will say, oh, I'm interested in sustainability or permaculture. And I'll say, have you heard of Alan Savory? And they'll be like, who? What? And I'll tell them and they'll be like, oh, OK, I'm going to go look that up. And, you know, I really I mean, I met some sheep yesterday at someone's house, which was my first time meeting sheep. And that was cool. Oh, cool. But I don't. <laughs> I'm not in that space, but I'm in this space, in the, the BFI space, and it's interesting to me. So I can help cross-pollinate those ideas. And, I, of course, the ideas make sense to me. And so it's like, oh, okay. And so people are hungry for that. So, you know, you can introduce people to exactly what they need to know at exactly the right time just by being someone who's out in the world, who's interested and passionate about the things that you are. And it's not always, you know, that sometimes is also the translation. There's this, there's a uh, societal, communal translation aspect of it as well, that we are people in the world who are regenerators, that we're part of the regenescence. And because that, that makes us, you know, that, that makes us mini buckies in a way, you know, whatever it is that yeah. we're passionate about, that we're seeding in the world, you know, becoming that polymath who's interested in a lot of things. That's the advantage because you can see a scenario and you go, oh, OK, you know, well, here's a seed, you know, or you see a scenario where you got to bring the water can. And if you, you're the one with the water can, then you bring the 
the water can. You know, I just feel like that's an important thing because I hear so many people in the idea space talk about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And the truth is we're never going to know everything. And that's a good thing. Yeah. It's good to not mm -hmm. know everything. And I think that's really important to the idea of translation. There are viewpoints that come with having a particular background. So like my background is in audio. So I would have to explain how to plug in this microphone differently to someone who has no experience with plugging mm -hmm. wires into each other. And so I've learned that there's a certain there's a certain difference in how I I can't just gloss over, oh, here's the XLR cable. You know, that's right. helpful in my profession. And we shouldn't not name the XLR cable. It's very helpful to know the difference between XLR cable and USB cable. However, not everybody has to know that, you know, and, and I might be the person or someone else who doesn't have to know that much, but knows enough to say, oh, you don't use that. You use this. Done. Problem solved. That person doesn't need to become like a platinum level mixer to be able to right. plug in their microphone for a good podcast, right? <laughs> so, and that's the thing. And and we're all on this spaceship together and we all have different skills and different gifts. And I feel like that's um, that's the perspective that I really care about is, you know, it's okay to not be an engineer. And it's okay that the engineers are really, really concerned about this fractional difference in, you know, the, the efficiency of the system. But you're the product person and you're like, it's ready for launch. Give me the product. We're going to start selling it because the finances need to be available. And then we can next iteration. You know, somebody's got to keep the engineers in check and someone's got to keep the finances people in check. And people have to have these different perspectives because it's how we come about what Bobby often says, like parallax, you know, we need to sometimes get that like zoom out, zoom in effect to get a real perception of what's happening in the whole system. Absolutely. And so, I mean, it is interesting. It's like, um, I, but I do think actually that we are by nature systems thinkers. I mean, yes. I do think that is in our human nature and that we're now starting to remember that and, and rediscover that. Um, and that, I think that's part of the reason why people are so hungry for it is because they identify with it. Yeah. And so now let's help people feed that curiosity. Uh, that's you know one of the things I'm very interested in. And so, I mean, the other thread I would just pull out of what you just said is, you know, I think specialization is useful. And I think we have over-specialized in Agreed. our society. And yeah. so that's why we end up having all these you know, call them silos. And so to the extent that we can all become more polymathic and have more range and be slightly good at a lot of different things, that actually makes us more flexible and resilient and regenerative, I would submit. The last thing I'll just say in relation to what you just shared is I do really feel like we're at this stage where leadership is collective. Um, yeah. Leadership has to be collective. Yeah. And so that's why it is important for us with shared interests and ideas and complementary interests and ideas to band together and to connect and to create networks and to create tipping points because mm -hmm. it doesn't actually take, I mean, what's the statistic? I think it's like, you know, 15% of a system to get to a tipping point, right? In <laughs> other words, as Margaret Mead said, you know, you don't need the whole world to get on board with these ideas. We only need some surprisingly small percentage of yeah. people to be committed to this new way of thinking and being for the rest of the world to kind of almost be required to come along. And so that is one of the things that gives me great hope as well as like, it's very easy to get to your point about being feeling overwhelmed. I mean, I think there's an enormous amount of climate anxiety right now, especially among young people as there should be, frankly. But I feel like that's our responsibility to help help uh, assuage because it, we're the ones largely who caused a lot of these problems. And so there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear, and those are very appropriate. But I think by banding together and sharing ideas and, and really putting our egos and our profits aside in many instances, I think 
um, I heard a great quote the other day, Darren Oleen, who's a podcaster and a really wonderful human who just wrote a crazy book about the ways and thousand ways in which we're poisoning ourselves through chemical inputs mm. uh, in everything in our lives, talked about what was the phrase he used, praying to the false god of profit. Yes. You know, I think we have allowed profit to get in the way of us really transcending this destructive, uh, degenerative way of operating the world. Mm -hmm. And I think until we get really clear that there's a lot of things that are going to have to be sublimated to the need for us to heal and transform, yeah, we're going to continue to kind of not be keeping our eyes on the prize. Well, the idea of the B corporation is just saying, okay, it's actually beneficial for a corporation to make profit because that's how it sustains itself. But we can choose to make profit, not the first motive in the corporation right. and hold ourselves to a higher standard. And I think that's necessary because I had a conversation with Lauren Minnis about the nonprofit space and about how difficult it is to constantly be looking for benefactors and that there's an exhaustion to that. So I think that intelligent people in my generation are figuring out, oh, okay, like we can make a company that has better values that can still be profitable and mm -hmm. that you can, I mean, that's where I get really inspired by Tom Chi and At One Ventures. It mm -hmm. seems like that's the kind of thing that they're trying to fund is let's get these businesses that are doing things that the world needs and let's get them capital. And I mm -hmm. think that's amazing. Did you get a chance to check out Tom Chi and Tencent Selden's talk during the last space camp? I did. It was amazing. You know, this idea of capitalizing new ventures differently is great. And that gets back to my whole thrust, which is like, we really need to have more funding flowing in the direction of restorative, regenerative businesses. But um, that's the idea. As long as you're on the subject of money and capital, one of the projects that I'm launching really as of last Friday officially is something called the Global Regenerative Finance Initiative, which oh, is a terrible cool. name and it needs to change. And the idea is that we need to redesign modern finance in service to regeneration. Mm. Uh, so moving from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, we need to account for all these externalities in the way we're pricing value, structuring deals, et cetera, et cetera, for regenerative outcomes. So the GRFI is bringing together some of the brightest minds around the world in a conversation about what is the purpose of capital, mm. a la Jed Emerson, who wrote the book by that name, what is the purpose of capital? How can we use it for regenerative ends? And how can we use it through an abundant lens? I think it's so important that people are doing the work. And I don't think that's a terrible name, by the way, because I think it does speak to the people in that industry that you are trying to reach. And then as you work, it's going to elaborate into a, a new language for it. But that's part of the work is like taking mm -hmm. people with know-how in finance, you know how things currently work, and being able to adapt and to redesign the new model. Because like it or leave it, we are currently in the middle of this economic system that we're in, until we're not. I, I also wonder if the possibility of impending financial collapse and need for complete restructuring is going to create opportunities for people oh, who absolutely. have the new model to say, all right, let's go, you know, let's put this in. And, you know, I know there's been people doing amazing work around that. And so I'm really excited to hear that that's an initiative that you're working on as well. Thank you. Wish us luck. But what I am really interested in too, is these evolutionary business models, right? So yeah. Zebras Unite is another great example. Um, that's okay. the co-op movement mm. here in the United States. They're doing amazing, important work. And so it's really about like, how do we design business models that are more in service to the broader whole as opposed to concentrating mm. a lot of the profits in the top echelons of the company or even for that matter to shareholders? I think we're going to see enormous evolution over time. It's not going to happen quickly, but the capitalist model that's present in the current capital markets is tricky because you keep extracting profits out of companies. It makes it very difficult over time for those companies to be sustainable. So you I think we're at a really interesting stage there. You mentioned micro-investments as well in your thesis for 
the flywheel project. And I think that's an interesting approach to, you know, in terms of people saying, how can I help? How can yeah. everyday people get involved? And I've seen some platforms now where like I was invited to become a micro investor in, I think it was the podcasting recording platform that I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. Like I would love to be an early stage investor in that because that's something that I use every day and I believe in. I feel like it gives people an opportunity to get involved. Yes, absolutely. So I think in the last couple of decades since the Jobs Act was passed, the opportunities for the everyday investor to get involved and put their money where their values are mm -hmm. has grown exponentially. So you have all these interesting crowdfunding platforms, such as Crowdfunder, such as Republic, WeFunder, and there are many more that I'm not even able to name. But, you know, I mean, even Indiegogo, for example, which is more for purpose companies and projects, like you can put $5 down or $25 down or $100 down on a company and become a shareholder. And you don't have to be an accredited investor to do that. And I mean, that's also happening at the community level. There's all these amazing community investment funds emerging where people can invest in the, the health and the regeneration of their own communities. How exciting is that? You get mm -hmm. to be proximate to the change that's happening right underneath your feet. As opposed to, you know, putting a hundred bucks in the capital markets for a company that, you know, you'll get to own a small fraction of a share and, you know, it's so abstract, right? It's so mm. far away from mm. your actual lived experience. So this is a very exciting time for people to be able to become shareholders at a virtually risk-free level in exciting new innovations, companies, projects, ideas that really gives them a sense of ownership in what they believe in, as opposed to what's necessarily already on offer. Yeah. And, and so with respect to Flywheel, the idea there is this is part, this is a really important part of the community engagement dimension, which I don't want to take credit for, by the way, some of my early project partners were really interested in the, in this community engagement piece. And I think it's amazing. So mm it's a no brainer, but yeah, you know, if you like have a community solar project happening in your neighborhood, why wouldn't you want to be an investor in that? Even yeah. at the smallest level, it gives yeah. you some sense of agency in your future. Yes. Oh, that's incredible. I love that. Well, and to your point earlier about a new way to do things in business, I think that my son's generation are going to be, you mentioned that the children that are really overwhelmed by climate stuff. I feel like our generations are the ones who will show the way in terms of like, there hasn't been, like when you got into the space, there was not, uh, it, uh, it, sustainability and regeneration was not a space. It was not a career field. And so in inventing these new ways of doing leadership, of doing groups, of, uh, of collaborating together, of doing business uh, in a way that uh, doesn't put profit first, but is, is thoughtful of the whole of earth. I think that that's what the future generations are going to look to for an example of like, hey, what, what do we do? How does this work? What can we do? And how can this be done? And so this is literally being seeded, created, um, re reworked and rethought in a way now that's very important to what's next, I think. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I don't know. It's it, for someone like me, I agree. It's such an exciting time. And I do, I have seen enormous waves of people coming into climate from technology in particular right now. There's a mass migration, if you will, mm. into climate tech. And I love seeing that. And, you know, as somebody who's been in the field as long as I have, you know, I have my moments of feeling like, you know, we're not making enough progress fast enough and it's mm. taken so long and we're still not where we need to be. And so it's, you know, I, I struggle with my own pessimism and managing that. So I just feel like I've got to keep reminding myself of the possibilities and opportunities and that every day is a new day and that we can still all make a difference. And especially if we work together and that's the gift, that's the opportunity that we have here is to show up every day and keep getting closer to what regeneration promises for us. And mm. it's only too late when I'm six feet under. So mm. I'll just keep going. Mm. <laughs> but it has taken a long time. You know, like I look at how much, how much energy has been expended by humans over the last, some small fragment, arguably of us, but, but 
I've devoted my career to this and I can, you know, everyone in my network has done the same. And so, you know, it just gives me pause. We have to take a step back and not get lost in the, in chasing the shiny objects, in mm. being too self-congratulatory, congratulatory, being humble, being honest um, about how much more transformation is necessary for us to leave the world in a better condition for the next generations. There was one other question I had for you that I wanted to ask before we go. So you also teach Shamatha meditation. Yeah, I think it's actually pronounced Shamatha. Uh, Shamatha. But yeah, Shamatha meditation. So yes, that is a really important part of who I've become. This all actually dates back to the beginning of when I started my company. So again, picture this. I was a first time entrepreneur as an adult. I had worked in other startups. I'd worked in venture capital. I'd worked in sustainability for 15 years or more at that point. And I was really clear about the vision for the company that I wanted to bring to the world. And I was confident, at least I felt confident at the time, and things were not manifesting in the way that I had hoped. Mm -hmm. And my friend committed suicide, my dad died, and I was not getting the investment that I had hoped to get, and things were really not going my way. And so call it a spiritual crisis or just a moment of reckoning or a dark night of the soul or whatever, you know, there's lots of labels for that moment in one's life. Um... I, you know, I'd always been interested in Eastern spiritual traditions and in meditation, like from afar, but I think it might've been Seth Godin's blog that turned me on to my teacher, Susan Piver. Mm. And Susan Piver runs something called the Open Heart Project. Mm. She's amazing. She is an ordained Buddhist monk. And she started the first virtual meditation sangha in the world mm. through what she calls this open heart project. And I found her right around this time that all these things were swirling around and feeling very challenging for me. And so I joined her virtual practice and she just has the most wonderful quality about her. And I just was finding this meditation practice, 10 minutes a day, super grounding for me. Mm -hmm. And just this whole idea of the op open heart, like she talks a lot about this and many meditation teachers will talk about like the ways in which, you know, our heart can become hardened over time with the pain and the normal challenges right. of life. And so the more we meditate, the more our heart softens and the more we open up to all that is in the world, you know, all of this, you know, as they say in, in Buddhist traditions, yeah, they talk about the idea of suffering. Mm. Life is suffering. And so at the time I was suffering a lot and um, the practice really grounded me. It really clarified things for me. It really was transformative for me. And so I did that very consistently for quite a number of years with Susan and her community. And then she offered um, a training hmm. to become uh, an instructor. And so I signed up for that without hesitating. And hmm. so now I not only practice and teach, but it's something that feels very fundamental to who I am as an executive coach and really as a leader of any kind. Because I think the, the practice of meditation helps us in every area of our life. Yeah, uh, It helps us with how we see life. It helps us how we walk through life. And for me, as somebody who was very type A and frankly, rather masculine from my many years working in business and mm -hmm. very ambitious, it helped me get in touch with you know, the softer parts of myself and yeah. open my heart and really see my life's work as, you know, my objective now is to continue to practice and serve and to relieve as much suffering in the world as I can. Yeah. Well, and it's neat how that can overlap with the passions we talked about earlier and also be right. essential. I think meditation has been very essential for me too. I love how 
at the beginning of the space camp this round, they opened with a meditation, sort of a collective centering, is it changes the qualitative side of the interaction, which often so, will be that input that, that helps the outcome as well. And I know business is starting to catch on to the idea of mindfulness. And I think that's very, very helpful. Um, and I thank you for, th I thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Cause, cause we all go through those very, very difficult times. And I feel like collectively as well, we're going through some very, very difficult times. And so to have that in your, in your, who you are, you know, as a, as a practice is extremely beneficial and helps, I think it helps navigate, you know, helps us just to orient where, like who who we are being in any place we find ourselves and wherever we're choosing to go as well. Um, yeah. Carrie Norton, where can people reach out to you if they want to connect and possibly collaborate with you on the Flywheel Project or other projects of yours? Yes. Well, first they can watch this video. You can no longer find me on Twitter but you can go to any of my websites, greenbusinessbasecamp.com, connect with me that way. You can go to carriemnorton.com and send me a message that way. I think I'm still, my contact information is still in the Space Camp archives, so to speak, or on the Slack channel. And yeah, and I'm on LinkedIn, obviously. Great place to find me. Good. Thank you so much, Stephen. Yeah. We'll be happy to stay in touch with you and your project, and hopefully you can bring the mission to the next space camp whenever that is. It was really an honor to meet you. And uh, is there anything else that you want to leave people with that you maybe would like to share before we go? Well, I just want to thank you for interviewing me. I've said some things here that I haven't said publicly anywhere, mm. so I'm a little bit nervous about that. But I think that's part of what we all have to get more comfortable with is you know, I was talking about this idea of honesty, you know, just stepping back always to keep asking ourselves, are we on the right path? Are we doing the right things? And also with respect to humans and sort of the citizen engagement piece of this, I think it's very easy to feel like it's all of our individual responsibilities to make these changes. And I think that is true and it does matter. And when we make small changes in our lives, we do have ripple effects. We do have an impact. Yeah. Uh, and it's not all on us. You know, the onus is not all on us to make transformations of systems because it's very easy to feel like what we do doesn't matter, but it does matter. And right. It's both. And it yeah. matters that we're trying not to use plastic. And it also matters that we hold our elected officials accountable for making the right decisions on behalf of our survival. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the systems are designed and we can redesign them. And that's why I call my podcast redesign is because we have to redesign all these systems in service to life. Yeah. And you can check out redesign on iTunes as well. Anyone else who's interested in, in interfacing with you and talking to you can reach out and begin to form a conversation. Thank you for joining us on the Spaceship Earth Mission Log. I'm Stephen Levitt. My other podcast is thelanguageofcreativity.com. We're on Substack and on iTunes as well as YouTube. And until next time, thank you for joining us on the Spaceship Earth Mission Log. Mm -hmm.